pre-Raphaelite brotherhood brought notoriety to British art in the 19th century. Bursting into the spotlight in the mid-century, they shocked their peers with a new kind of radical art. This program explores how they attained riches and celebrity, and by exploiting burgeoning mass markets, became the forefathers of the commercial modern artist. In the mid-19th century, a group of students, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, John Everett Millet, and William Holman Hunt, had shaken up British art. For five years, between 1848 and 1853, they had defied convention, applying new realism to religious pictures, taking landscape painting in a new direction by recording nature with photographic detail, and shocking their public by placing controversial modern subjects at the centre of their canvases. But as the 1860s dawned, the Pre-Raphaelites had outgrown the avant-garde and were ready to embrace commercial fame and fortune with art designed to please the masses. Crucial in moving the group into the mainstream were Victorian entrepreneurs who saw the mass market potential of art. One such business adventurer was art dealer Ernest Gamba, who in May 1866 threw the party of the season in his home in northwest London in honour of a painting for which he had orchestrated celebrity status. The work in question was The Finding of the Saviour in the Temple by William Holman Hunt. Gambart hired a theatrical gaslighting expert to give this star work the limelight treatment it deserved. But then an unsuspecting gentleman lit a match. Gambart's house was destroyed, and one poor dinner guest was killed. Thankfully for Gambart and the history of art, Hunt's picture was still being hurried across London to the party when the explosion occurred. After all, Gambart had paid five and a half thousand pounds, over two million pounds in today's money, for the work. And though this had been the highest amount ever paid to a living artist, it was an investment he never regretted. The picture was painted by Hunt when he was on location in Palestine. His eastern truthfulness, Gambart sensed, would wow the Victorian public. Hunt went to great lengths to get real rabbis to pose. And, of course, he also gives Jesus the characteristics of the Galilean boy. Um, he tries to reproduce the original racial type of Jesus. He's inspired by people who've been writing biographies of Jesus, not religious texts, but historical texts of trying to reconstruct the facts of his life. And Hunt tries to do this in paint here. So, for example, he shows us the authentic draperies, exotic draperies, particularly of Christ himself. And you can see, although his costume looks purple, when you get close up to it, it's actually a beautiful combination of red and blue stripes with this glorious green trimming here. Hunt shows us an incident from Christ's life when they come to Jerusalem and the Holy Family have lost their son, but they find him in the temple talking to the, the Jewish elders there. We see this fantastic view across Jerusalem here, but we also see the grimmer world of the beggar and, of course, these two pieces of wood make us think of the crucifixion, which will be Jesus' ultimate fate. Even the background, again, has typically of Hunt a little motif which extends the story, the way 15th century paintings extend the story using simultaneous narrative. 
painting wasn't finished when Hunt returned to London in 1855. He continued to paint from local Jewish models. He even went to Crystal Palace to paint some more of the exotic architecture. And it wasn't actually until 1860 that it was complete. Gambart saw that by creating spectacle around the picture and by giving it a high profile, he could also create mass market demand for reproductions of it. Gambart was an extraordinary man. He was a picture dealer, a very, very good one, perhaps one of the top three picture dealers in the country. Gambart devised with his colleagues three ways of making money out of contemporary art. One was to buy and sell the picture for a profit. Another way was to take the picture on tour. And what you'd do is you'd take it into a hall and then you'd drape it dramatically and light it dramatically, very intensely with gaslight or limelight. And you would have rows of seats and you'd pay a bob, a shilling, to get in and look at this picture. And it was a thing that the middle classes did at weekends and leisure days and in the evenings, uh, in much the same way as we now would go to the cinema. And it was a spectacle. It was kind of the Spielberg of its time to go and see this, this, the, the dramatic new picture by Mr. Hunt. So the third way of making money out of pictures was to make engravings of them. It was published in a limited edition. And, uh, and they all had to be declared to the Print Sellers Association and registered in this book. Finding the Saving Temple, Art the Painter, Hunt, Engraver Blanchard, Sublime Engraving. In, with prints, the, the earlier you take an impression, um, the stronger and better it is. So obviously the price reflects that. And the first thousand off the plate, they're 15 guineas. And then there's 25 presentation proofs made. Now, these were just for giving to influential people to help sales, like the Queen or Lord so and so. And then after that, another thousand, slightly later, they were 12 guineas. And then another thousand, making 3,000 in all, they were 8 guineas. You just have to do some sums now to figure out how much money that is. Uh, I think that. Gambart realised at least £50,000 from the venture with this print alone, which translate to, uh, what, tw £20 million now? It is an astonishingly large sum of money. And it wasn't just Gambart who benefited. Hunt, too, reaped massive rewards, coinciding as it did with new reproductive techniques, which were making quality mass marketing possible for the first time. For instance, you had steel plates. They were either made of steel or you were able to face copper plates with a coating of steel. And this meant that the plate would go on producing good impressions over and over again. So you, it was quite easy to produce 10,000 impressions. First, the engraver would transfer the drawing to the surface of the plate and etch an outline of the painting. Then, a burin would be used to cut out thin furrows following the sketched lines. Ink was then rubbed into the incised lines, then passed through a rolling press to make the print. So it's important, I think, to stress that the, the artists saw them as commercial, highly commercial ways of getting their art out to more people and, frankly, making lots of money. And that's what it's all about when it comes down to it. Printmaking has always been a very commercial business, and the Victorians were dad hands at being highly commercial, hard-nosed businessmen made Hunt a millionaire in modern terms. It also made him the most eligible bachelor at London, as he acknowledged himself. He found it slightly scary, I think, and launched one of the first truly international careers. Fresh from the commercial success of The Finding of the Saviour, Gambart bought the copyright of an earlier work by Hunt, The Light of the World. This would become the most viewed picture in the world and catapult Hunt to even greater fame and fortune, though he could barely have foreseen this when he painted it in 1851. Hunt, he 
painted it during the night in a little shelter that he set up in the orchard that we see here. Hunt had been an atheist, so his decision to paint an image of Christ was really a kind of experiment in looking for the spiritual in man. And um, one of the things we've noticed actually recently is the way that the light from the lantern, not only does it cast these wonderful opalescent shadows across the white robe of Christ, but it seems to create something very reminiscent of a death's head or a skull on the door, which suggests that Hunt is not just thinking about spirituality, he's also thinking about the span of human life, about life and death. I'm beginning to move into a sort of more spiritual exploratory phase of his painting from basically dealing with modern subjects in the, in the modern world. Some 49 years later, Hunt painted another version of Light of the World, which is now in St. Paul's Cathedral. This painting is not only much larger, but brighter, and the death mask has gone. But the really interesting difference is that the apertures in the lamp have been changed in the second version, so that one of the, the apertures has been turned into a crescent moon shape. The idea that the painting embraces all different kinds of religious faith, that it is not specifically one denomination. The painting was bought by another extraordinary man. There are so many extraordinary men in, these, in this story, whose name was Charles Booth. Now, Charles Booth, strangely, was an agnostic. He wasn't sure whether he believed or not in God, and so for him to buy this enormous and very celebrated painting of Christ is rather extraordinary. What he did next is even more extraordinary. <laughs> The painting was sent out to tour around the empire in 1905. First it went to Canada, then it went to Australia, then to New Zealand and then to South Africa. And it's now thought that over 7 million people saw it in these showroom conditions. That and the uh, proliferation of images that followed it around made this picture the most famous picture in the world. Whilst dealers and entrepreneurs were exploiting the popularity of the pre-Raphaelites, a new breed of art buyer was also emerging. The Industrial Revolution had filled the pockets of businessmen, who were only too willing to push the pre-Raphaelite production line onwards with direct commissions. I think there's an idea that Victorian patrons were northern businessmen who weren't particularly cultured. That's a bit of a caricature. And certainly, I don't think it's true of the people who were interested in pre-Raphaelites. I think they were often very highly educated and certainly very interested in Christianity and religion. They weren't the kind of people who say, I don't know anything about art, but I know what I like. They weren't stupid. There may have been some patrons like that, but I don't think they would have bought pre-Raphaelites because pre-Raphaelite painters are quite demanding, really. For Dante Gabriel Rossetti in particular, patronage offered him a private market for his work. Increasingly reclusive and bohemian, by the 1860s, some of Rossetti's paintings were becoming too risque for public consumption. Nevertheless, Bohemia had private appeal. And one of those prepared to buy into it was the Liverpool banker George Ray. His most prized possession was the Beloved by Rossetti. And what is so remarkable is that we have uh, George Ray's direct reaction to this painting. Rossetti delayed and delayed and procrastinated and asked for more money. Uh, this was par for the course with Rossetti. But eventually, about two years after the original agreed date, the painting arrived in Birkenhead. And George Ray writes this letter to Rossetti, really to thank him, I think. And it says, we've taken the thing out of its crate and we've put it on an easel. And my wife and I, we stood in raptures, adoring it. It's the most beautiful thing. And these are ex exact words of getting an electric shock of beauty when he looked at the picture. And every time he looked at the picture, this electric shock renewed itself. We have here the whole spectrum of female beauty, which is in a way intended to encapsulate the idea of 
uh, female loveliness. So the central figure was painted from a model called Mary Ford, who had a very English complexion. And to accompany her, Rossetti has introduced figures of darker hair and darker skins. And we know that the figure on the right was painted from a Romani woman called Keomi. And here is a woman with Indian-looking features who was actually a mixed-race woman who was born in Jamaica. And in the front, Rossetti introduced the figure of a young African girl. Partly, as Rossetti said, because the jet colour would be invaluable to set off the rich colours of the rest of the painting. He inserted this back figure at the moment when the American Civil War and the issue of slavery was at the forefront of political discussion in this country as well as in the United States. There was a very grave risk that Britain would intervene against the Union. The abolitionists in North America sent over delegation after delegation urging people not to allow this to happen. And Rossetti was one of those approached as a mover and shaker of the time. And it's at that moment that he brings in this small figure who represents the enslaved people of the North Americas. Despite the implicit political message in The Beloved, Rossetti's explicit infatuation with the female form held huge appeal with his patrons. As his brother William said, the gentlemen who command or purchase their pictures were chiefly responsible for the result. Holman Hunt was disgusted by their eroticism, as was the art critic John Ruskin, who wrote to Rossetti, They are wonderful to me in their realism, awful in their coarseness. I have to tell you, the people you associate with are ruining you. While Rossetti's pictures filled patrons' homes, they now stood in stark contrast to Hunt's public religious art. As for the third founder of pre-Raphaelitism, John Everett Millet ventured into portraiture and narrative painting as the century progressed. The brotherhood which had briefly painted as one had fragmented totally. Perhaps the last time the work of the three major pre-Raphaelites was united was as part of an innovative publishing venture. You've compromised the art form. Book illustration flourished in the mid-19th century due to an increasingly literate middle class, improved technology, and amended tax laws on paper. Seeing the potential of this, Ruskin persuaded the poet laureate Alfred Tennyson to allow Millet, Hunt and Rossetti to illustrate the next edition of his poems. In doing so, a new chapter of British art was born, one referred to now as the Golden Age of Illustration. The designs that the Pre-Raphaelites made for book illustration are hugely important because they are original works of art. They are original designs made specifically for the books in which they appear. And as such, I think they are still underrated as they are some of the most beautiful achievements of the Pre-Raphaelites that they ever made. The book was to be published by Edward Moxon and became known as the Moxon Tennyson. The artist would draw the illustration to the actual size they would appear in the book. An engraver would then use a burin to cut out the design on a square box of wood, leaving a relief image. This would be printed along with the text on the same page. The artists would be involved in all aspects of the process, often sending back detailed instructions to the engraver of any changes needed such as Rossetti did in his illustration, The Palace of Art. What I've always found complex about it is what point of the poem it's actually illustrating. And the bit I think it is illustrating is this verse. Or in a clear walled city on the sea, near gilded organ pipes, her hair wound with white roses, slept St. Cecily, an angel looked at her.
I think if we look carefully at the engraving, the angel is doing rather more than just looking. He's actually bending to kiss her. And in the front left foreground, you have a soldier eating an apple, holding a spear. In the background, you have the city and a ship. And what is so extraordinary is the detail that's been achieved on a little square of boxwood and the cross-hatching and the delicacy and the light, the difference of light and shade. And although it's a black and white illustration, to me, it's full of colour. And that is what I think is so remarkable. In the same volume, Holman Hunt continued with his Middle Eastern themes, illustrating recollections of the Arabian Nights. And Millet told the story of Mariana, from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, whose dowry has been lost at sea, and as a result was abandoned by her fiancé. Millet does not allegorise on his own hook. He does actually look at the text and intelligently interprets it. But he's not a pedestrian performer. He puts into this illustration of Mariana a great passion but he does actually use the text carefully, and I think it's fair to say that he's interpreting her tears fell with the Jews at even, her tears fell ere the Jews were dried. And I think what there is in Millet is a, a narrative element, but also a huge passion, which reflects Tennyson's own. And no matter how divergent their styles were, these illustrations spoke to the new emerging market. We have to remember that you know, the big readership for novels, for poems, was the, you know, the burgeoning female audience. I think it's these sort of, you know, psychological, you know, sexually complex subjects which really appeal to the um, um, female audience. And these artists, you know, Millet and Rossetti in particular, really understand sort of, you know, female um, um, psychology. Book illustration was yet another example of the pre-Raphaelites making their work available to a larger market, spreading their fame yet further. And so by the 1860s, they were at the height of their powers. Commissions continued to roll in for Rossetti, Hunt made further trips to the Middle East, whilst Millet was drawn towards more obvious commercial subjects. At a very early stage, Millet made a very uh, telling remark. He said, patrons had better buy my paintings now when I'm painting for fame. Later on, I will be painting for money. And this is when he develops a different way of working, when he ceases to be a pre-Raphaelite and becomes a post-Raphaelite. This sort of um, transition really takes place in the 1860s, and it's due to a number of factors. The fact that he has to become more commercial because he has his eight kids, you know, wife, family um, um, to support, but also because he's becoming very dissatisfied with the earlier way of working. He's putting strain on his eyesight, on his body. He also needs to produce works at a faster pace. So Millet starts painting child subjects in the 1860s. He felt the most beautiful subject any artist could paint was a child, because he thought children really had this quality of abstract beauty in them, which is really missing in adults. Millet was now to follow in the footsteps of Sir Joshua Reynolds, famous for his child portraits, painted some 80 years earlier. Oh, his child subjects are not as sort of, um, ideal as Reynolds is. They are real children. This is obviously based on his understanding of his own children and also his close study of children in general. He wanted to paint these children as they really were. They don't simper, they don't smile um, at the, you know, the, the beholder, as they do in some new earlier pictures of this kind. A typical painting of Millet's in this genre was Cherry Ripe, completed in 1879, which was a reworking of Reynolds's Miss Penelope Boothby. 
you did this painting, you really convinced the idea of the cute. How would you create a cute image of a child? It's really by exaggerating the proportion of the head in relationship to the body. So with this mob cap on her head and this sort of long, you know, on tresses, and the fact she has no neck, so there's almost no neck, it exaggerates the head in relationship to the rest of her body. And then the wonderful conceit of having her toes turned inwards on one slightly above the other. It's just how children sit and how she's trying to desperately to keep you know, the, the pose and be a little lady by having her hands sort of clasped in her lap. So it's a wonderful understanding how a child is you know, trying to sort of pose for an adult. It's really for an adult on sensibility. And then he also puts this background in this dark, slightly sinister background with honeysuckle and fox glove. In 1885, Millet was made a baronet, the first artist to be honoured with an hereditary title. And the following year, his painting, Bubbles, would make him the ultimate commercial artist. He chooses to show it to a dealer's gallery, just showing how, you know, Millet's, I'm not sure, he's a canny capitalist. He's thinking of, you know, of his audience, different ways to sort of market um, his work. It's also a very personal image, because it's based on his grandchild, Willie James, sitting on you know, a log, blowing on bubbles, where he's wearing this wonderful 18th century spiritual or Fontroy costume. He's meditating on the bubble which might burst at any moment. It's about the transitory nature of life. It only really becomes a sort of an internationally famous um, image when T.J. Barrett, who was the managing director of Pears Soap, alights on this image and thinks of its marketing possibilities. Having bought the painting and the copyright, he was quite at liberty to do what he wanted with it. But because Millet was a famous artist at this time, an artist who was loved by the public, he thought it would only be in order to go to Millet and to get him on board. And what he proposed to do with the picture, which was basically to put the words Pears Soap across the top and insert a little bar of soap at the bottom. And um, according to Barrett's account, Millie was thought, how splendid, what a wonderful you know, technology is taking place on um, here. And isn't it good, these, my painting, a very serious you know, painting, you know, with you know, deep meanings in it, will be relayed to a broad audience, to help educated masses in matters of art. You know, I'm all you know, behind you. You know, he was, you know, he was pragmatic, he was very candid about the whole um, matter. And so um, the painting was turned into an advert for pear soap. And of course the meaning changed you know, altogether. Rather than being a philosophical painting, it was really you know, about soap. It's about you know, a bit of merchandise. It's, you know, it's a good commodity. Bubbles became representative of the ultimate commercialization of art in the 19th century. Although orchestrated by a manufacturing tycoon, the pre-Raphaelites themselves always had an eye to commercial opportunities. One of the interesting things about the Raphaelites is how good they were at self-fashioning, at creating a celebrity persona for themselves. Hunt's adventures in the Holy Land were very important to his painting, but of course they're also very important to his reputation because they gave him this adventurous glamour. They published memoirs in order to sort of build their reputation. So as their reputations build, of course, the value of their paintings also built. And they embrace the celebrity alongside the mass culture that they were engaging with. Of course, celebrity goes along with that naturally. So they were very modern in that sense. Modern in the sense that the commercial potential of their work continues to be exploited today. Millet's Ophelia remains the best-selling image in Tate Britain's bookshop, whilst pre-Raphaelite exhibitions play to packed houses in the UK and abroad. And modern in the sense, too, that their lives continue to fascinate. Rossetti became more of a recluse and eventually lost it on drugs and women. Millet sold out and became part of the establishment, elected to president of the Royal Academy. Whilst Hunt, in old age, 
rallied against the modern art he saw emerging around him. But despite this, there is no denying that in a brief five-year span after the Brotherhood formed in 1848, they did revolutionize British art, introducing a new form of realism and composition that overturned the principles that had dominated Western art since the Renaissance.